I preach in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I've been thinking about what I want to say to you this morning, and I want to tell you a part of the epiphany story, but I need to back up and tell you a part of the Christmas story because they're connected. Christmas, at its heart, is, is, is about God being born, about God becoming one of us humans and all the messiness and the vulnerability that comes with a newborn baby. God is being born. Think about that. But let us remember that the angels do not appear to the prestigious and the powerful with this news. They don't go to Caesar Augustus or to King Herod or to the chief priests in the temple to announce the birth of God's son. The ones that the angels choose to invite to come and greet him are the shepherds, the people from the very lowest social class. This is a big part of our story. God chooses to be born, not into wealth or prestige, but into poverty and obscurity. God chooses to be born to ordinary people. Think about that. This is a big part of our story. Some of you know one of my favorite things in the world is to share this story, this Christmas story with children and then to stand back and ask them what they make of it. Holly had the opportunity to do that with our kids this year. I wonder why God would choose to be born here. I wonder. And a beautiful, insightful answer came once from a little boy named Huron. He was a friend of Sophia's. And he said, I think that if he had been born in a castle with a king or a queen as his parents, we would have thought that he belonged just to those people in that country. But since he was born to just regular people, he could belong to everybody. Think about that. It's a huge part of our story. The way that God comes to us is the very thing that shows us that we are all connected. <clears throat> and the idea that some people should be left out or that some people or nations are better than others. The idea of supremacy is not of God. That's the Christmas story. And next, then, as it continues to unfold, the story goes that wise men, astronomers from the East, also come to see this baby. These are people who live their lives by looking for signs. They read stars. And they follow one such star that leads them to this little king. This is the epiphany story. But we start to see how they are connected to the Christmas story. Now, whether this story is historically accurate may or may not be important to you. What I hope matters to us is that these magi, these three stargazers from the East, were outsiders from a completely different land with different religions and languages and ways of seeing things. And they are the ones who recognize that a king is being born. This is a big part of our story. Our Christmas and our epiphany stories include angels and stars and wonder and beauty. But let's make no mistake, right in there, they also include darkness and violence and the very worst parts of human nature. They also can include the story of King Herod, a king so obsessed by power 
and narcissism and domination. A king so threatened by the idea, the very possibility of a new king, so threatened by a child that he orders the slaughter of all the male children in the land. This violent order of a jealous king to kill these holy innocents, we call them, is of course what prompts the holy family, Joseph and Mary and Jesus, to flee from Judea in Israel into neighboring Egypt. You see, we don't often read these stories out loud on Sunday mornings. This is a part of the lectionary we often leave out, but it is also a part of our epiphany story. I want us to think about that. Jesus, our Lord, and his parents became refugees, completely dependent upon the acceptance and the kindness and the goodwill of strangers in a foreign land. Think about that the next time you meet an immigrant or a refugee. It's a big part of what formed Jesus. And so it is also a big part of our story. These are the epiphany stories. And like all scripture, these Christmas and epiphany stories aren't only about what happened to Jesus and the people who lived in his time. They are also about us. We find ourselves in them, the events of our times, the meaning in our lives. We start to see how our stories are connected to those stories. And as it turns out, we don't just get to tell the good parts of our stories. We have to tell the whole story. We have to face all of it, see and seek to understand all of it, not just the parts we read on Sunday mornings. The truth is that violence and fear press right up against the peace and goodwill in the narratives in our scriptures. And it also does the same thing in our lives. It's all there. The epiphany story about kings who follow a star does include beauty and wonder, gold and frankincense and myrrh. But we also have to not acknowledge that it is a story that includes the very present and current themes in our lives of violence, jealousy, conspiracy, lies, bigotry, hatred, and fear. It's all there. It's all part of the story. It was so helpful to remember that for me, and I hope it's I hope it's helpful for you to reflect on that as we remember the events of this past week. When we watched a violent mob break into our nation's capital. So many of you shared with us, called us and texted us and said, I can't believe what I am seeing. How do we even begin to make sense of this? How can this be our story. Well, all, as we are all coming to understand, it is our story, all of it. The promise and the possibilities of a democracy, our hopes and dreams as diverse people united under the principles of freedom, and also, and we have to see it and name it and seek to understand it, it also includes the breach, the brokenness that has been cultivated and grown in our country, incited in recent days, but it has been fomenting for centuries. These are divisions that go way beyond partisan views and values. 
as we saw, they include the intention to dominate and to devour. The violence that we saw this week brings up all kinds of feelings. Fear, outrage, a sense of helplessness. It's all part of our story. And as Christian people, we ask, so many of you who have asked, called us, texted us, emailed us, and asked, what can I do? Is there anything that we can do in the face of all of this? What can I do? When that question comes up, this is when our stories can be so helpful because they show us that we can always do something. And we must. We always have a choice. And what we choose to do and to say, our actions and our words matter. The Dean of Washington's National Cathedral and the Bishop in the District of Columbia chose these words this week. They write, today's chaos at the Capitol is as clear a signal as anyone need that we are a deeply divided and fractured nation. Look at the rage, see the fear, look at this pain. We cannot and will not excuse it, nor will we sanction it. But we use it to see the brokenness in our body politic, and we must step up and do what we can to repair the breaches in our life together. They continue, we have endured much as a nation, and we can see now how much further we still have to go, but we have no other choice. We have only this life only this nation, only this planet. We are all in this together. God must be our guide and love must direct our way. God must be our guide and love must direct our way. The hardest part is that we can't just cut people off cast them off. Somehow we have to remember that we are all connected and it's going to take our greatest efforts and nothing short of God's amazing grace to be able to reconstruct a way of living together that lives up to our nation's greatest ideals. Not just as principles of justice, but true justice that acknowledges it where it has failed. Not just the principles of freedom, but true freedom that does not marginalize or other anyone. A way of being together that recognizes our need for and our connection to each other. And that is worthy of our children. So when we think there is nothing that we can do, when we feel helpless, when we feel like we have nothing to offer the world, we can remember our stories. Remember that God chose Mary and Joseph, regular people, to parent the Christ. When we are despairing and when the divisions, even in our own families, seem beyond repair, when we think that we have nothing constructive to say, we can remember that the angels entrusted the greatest message ever told to shepherds, just ordinary people like you and me. When we fear that there is no way, just picture the wise men who listened to their intuitions and followed a moral compass that warned them to return by another way, 
There's always a way. There's always a way. And let us picture that Jesus as a child himself was an outsider relying on the kindness of ordinary people like you and me. Opportunities are going to present themselves to you to do something. I believe that. Opportunities to stand up, to speak up, to follow your intuitions, your moral compass, to soften a heart, to change a mind, to be guided by God's love. There are everyday moments that will present themselves to us. This is our story. So believe it. Amen.